Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 12 of The Mountains We Climb. In each of these episodes, we're going to be diving into the mind of someone who has overcome significant challenge and adversity in their life so that we can see what is really possible and what it really takes. I'm your host, Jordan Kilpatrick-Smith, and today we're going to be exploring Brenda Sheldrake's journey from alcoholism to, to drug addiction to 20 years sober. Just before we start, I'd like to remind everyone that you can post your comments and questions live throughout the episodes. Join us in these conversations right below the live stream on YouTube and on Facebook. Brenda, thank you so much for being here with me today. Thank you, Jordan. I'm happy to be here. So where does your journey through all of this start? I was about 25 years old. Um... I was in a marriage that had a lot of issues and challenges and my solution to the challenges was to turn to alcohol. I spent a lot of time in bars um, till very late at night and in the bars, what I was looking for, I was really looking for a place to belong. I was really looking for a place to fit in. And I thought I found it in the bars. I didn't have a lot of friends. I didn't have a lot of people that I could connect with. And so I, I picked one bar and I hung out there all the time and I would spend a lot of money on alcohol and I would buy like bottle service and other people would drink with me. And so I thought those people were my friends. Right. And I would, I continued to do that. Um, and it, it just, it got away from me. Um, at first I would drink a little bit and they would drink a lot, but I wasn't, I wasn't feeling that connection that I was looking for. I wasn't, I wasn't, I couldn't say to those people, Hey, let's, you know, let's, let's have coffee tomorrow or let's, let's go to a movie next week or let's do something different instead of go to the bar tonight. Right. They were people I met at the bar, people I found at the bar. And so that was the only life for them as well. And so I was drinking more and more. I was trying to fill up an emptiness that I felt inside of me. And in trying to fill up the emptiness, it was like seeking for a connection with people. Yeah. Right. I, I think, I think somewhere inside, I knew that if I could connect to people that the emptiness would be less. Um, I miss, I misread what connection meant because my experience, all of my past experience, all of my life experience told me that connection meant um, fixing people. Mm. It meant healing them, healing whatever was broken in them. And so when I would look for connections, when I would look for relationships of any kind, I was looking for other people who had something about them that was broken that I thought I could fix. I get you. So, yeah. Okay. Continue. Sorry. So I, um, and, and, and what you look for, what you focus on is definitely what you find. So I found broken people. Mm -hmm. I found sick people and then I tried to fix them. But the only place that these people wanted to join me because these people weren't looking to be fixed. Mm -hmm. They thought they were okay. They were okay where they were. So the only place I could join them was in the bar. And because the hole in me wasn't getting filled up because the emptiness was still there, I was drinking more and more. Mm -hmm. It got to a point where I would go to the bar at about nine o'clock at night. And this bar was in another province and I would drink until the bar closed, which was like three o'clock in the morning. And then I would go to a restaurant and try and get into a position where I could drive home. So right. it was, it was a dangerous, unhealthy, in every way, unhealthy life. And how long did that last for? It lasted for about a year and a half. And the it was a really fast slide um, from drinking a few drinks to drinking more drinks to drinking whole bottles myself to just 
and I was, I was a functional alcoholic because I could drink like crazy at night. I could go home. Um, now I always drank. This was the thing at the end. I always drank to the point of throwing up. I knew I didn't want to throw up. I knew, I knew it wasn't going to be a pleasant thing, but that's how far it was. It was going. And I would drink till I threw up. I would sleep it off and I would get up and I would do the things around the house that needed to be done or go to my work. I had a job. I would go to work. So people didn't really know. So you're, you're in your mid twenties, you're going, getting absolutely plastered from nine to three coming home and then going to work, (laughs) living like a, you know, on the surface, a fairly normal life, but all the while having this feeling of emptiness that you're, that you're trying to fill. What were, like, what were you thinking about this at the time? Um, Like what thoughts were going through your head? Was this, was this normal for you? Did you know something was wrong? Um, Did other people around you say anything? Most people didn't say anything. Um, I was living quite far from my family, so they didn't see it. Um, my husband, at the time, he he definitely saw it. He could see it, and he was he was not impressed. <laughs> I'm definitely not impressed because who's going to be impressed with the fact that he would get home from work at five o'clock, he would have dinner, he would go to bed early, and I would disappear, and I would reappear about the time that he was getting up to get ready to go to work right in a not very functional state yeah so yeah he was he was unimpressed and I at first in the beginning it seemed normal in the beginning it seemed like a normal thing to do because I thought that when people said find a group where you fit in find a place where you can go this was okay. I, I was trying to live the television life. This was my cheers. I'm showing my age now, but, but anybody who saw the TV series cheers, this was my cheers bar. Hmm. Cause I would walk in and everybody knew my name. Right. Right. So it was, it was all, it was cool. It was wonderful because, and I wasn't going to pick up men. I wasn't going for that purpose. I was going looking for friendship. Yeah. And I never had the problem with getting hit on because the bar I picked was a male strip club. So they're the only men in the club were the men who were dancing. Right. So I thought, okay, well, even better. This means I'm making friends with women. I want to make friends with women. And I thought, okay, so that's friends. That's what friends do. Um, At the end, I knew it wasn't working and I was frustrated and I was sad because I I didn't have the friendships I was looking for. I didn't have, there was no connection starting to form. There was no anything. And I was looking around going, okay, I don't know what to do. I don't, I don't know where, where to look next. Where else should I look? I, I don't know why, but I didn't even think about like joining social clubs or groups or any of those things other than that the whole told me that I needed people I could fix. Right. Right. And so joining a chess club wasn't going to show me people I could fix. So it wouldn't, it, I believed it wouldn't fill the hole. Right. So, so just for everyone listening, the hole is a, a metaphorical hole in self, right. And yes. leading to the emptiness and then, okay. So I I'm feeling this emptiness. I want to help people because that's what it means for me, or that's my understanding of what it means to connect with people to fill this emptiness hole. Yeah. And led you down into deep alcoholism without friends (laughs) no friends severe alcoholism and um the marriage ended yeah i mean not surprisingly i mean who would put up with that i if if it were reversed i wouldn't have put up with that right i i wouldn't have asked him to do that for me so it ended Mm -hmm. um and that made the whole even worse because now I, I, I had to move, I moved out, I moved into an apartment by myself and people were telling me 
you need to have a relationship with yourself before you can have a relationship with anybody else. And that didn't make any sense. I didn't understand that. It's like relationship with yourself. What's that? Yeah. Can, can we pause there for a moment and talk about that? Cause I think that a lot of people really struggle with understanding that. Right. Um, and so you're talking about this emptiness. Uh, and so just before we go on to, well, where does like, what, how did your understanding of having a relationship with self change? Where did the emptiness come from? Well, I think the emptiness was always there because I never had a relationship with myself. Um, some people, and through time I have learned to, but some people can say to themselves, you're okay. Hmm. Everything is okay. You're doing the right thing. Your judgment is right. You got this. I mean, I think we all have times where we question it, but, but the majority of the time you can say to yourself, you got this. Well, my life was kind of flip-flopped that. My, my mom was very unwell. Um, we weren't going to go into this part of the story, but it sort of connects with where this came from. So I, I think there's probably time. Um, my mom's health was very bad and I took on the role in the family of being a caretaker. I was the, if you know anything about how people assume roles, I assumed the role of the fixer. Right. And so I always had this little voice because I couldn't fix my mom. She was the first person I wanted to fix and I couldn't fix her. So, and this started when I was like, young like 13 years old I decided I was going to fix my mom because 13 year old brain when they hear that their mother's going to die they go no no she's not she's going to live forever right and I'm going to control that because I'm all powerful because when you're a kid you think you're all powerful right mm -hmm. but that was the last time I thought I was all powerful that and so when I lost that when I lost that belief that I was all powerful I started uh, it, the the, the whole way I saw myself flip-flopped and I didn't see myself. I couldn't say to myself, okay, you got that. Okay. You're doing good. Okay. You've got things under control. I was saying, okay, it's, it's crazy, right? Everything out here is crazy. Oh, so, for people who are listening that, that aren't watching, what is, can you say, <laughs> say what that means? All, all around me, anything outside of my body felt crazy. Right. My, my world felt crazy. Mm -hmm. So if I wanted, I, and I didn't know how to stop the crazy, stopping the crazy meant fixing the problem and fixing the problem meant fixing my mom. Right. And so that, that followed me until I got, when I got married, then I was just looking for new people to fix. I was looking to fix my husband. I was looking to fix everyone I knew. And when you're around healthy people, they don't want to be fixed. So healthy people that, so I was broken. Healthy is not attracted to broken. Broken is attracted to broken. Right. So I, so the people I could attract were more broken people. And it just kept following me and the emptiness, the, the loneliness got bigger because broken people and fixing people, I now know, doesn't make you feel whole. It doesn't make you feel fulfilled. Hmm. It doesn't, it doesn't do any of those things. It just makes you look for somebody else who's more broken. Right. And generally broken people don't want to be fixed. Most broken people feel that they're okay where they are. Hmm. And if they think they're okay, then you can't fix them. Then you got to go look for somebody else who's broken. And the degree of brokenness was escalating because somebody who's a little bit broken, well, they're still good where they are. They haven't hit their bottom yet. So you started to seek out the rock bottom. Yeah. I so was just before we go there, how, how does the relationship to self or rather your lack of relationship to self 
fit into all of this? Like, how do, how does that play in here? Because I didn't recognize that I wasn't doing anything that was good for me. I thought this was what was good for me. I thought, I thought that fixing people, I still, I mean, now when I think back on it, it sounds like crazy thinking, right? But when you're in the middle of it, if, you, if you're in the middle of a tornado, you don't recognize that you only recognize what's immediately right in front of you. And the only thing I could see that was immediately right in front of me was this, this emptiness and this sadness. Mm -hmm. The world looked gray. Like if you're one, my world looked gray and felt very hopeless. Yeah. So hopeless, empty, lonely. And is it fair of me to say that that, that was coming from a lack of relationship with oh, yourself? Oh, definitely. And so how has, just before we move on to, to rock bottom, how has your understanding for the people who are at home, who are listening to this, who are in that boat where they're like, what the hell do you mean to have a relationship with yourself? Like, what does that even mean? What, what do you say to that? How has that changed for you? Um, I listen to myself now. I listen to myself all the time. If, if, if it's a good thing, then it comes from somewhere in, in, in my heart, in, in like my physical body. Mm. If it's a self doubt thing, or if it's, if it's something that's not good for me, it generally originates someplace either in my head or on one of my shoulders. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to sound odd, but you and I have had a lot of conversations about yeah. it. And I believe that I have, I have like angel devil, right? Mm -hmm. And my angels on one shoulder and my devil's on the other shoulder. And, and my devil tells me the stuff that's not good for me. And my mm -hmm. angel tells me the stuff that is good for me. And sometimes they fight with each other. Yeah. I don't have multiple personalities. I don't have any kind of a multiple personality disorder. That's just, that's my visualization of what is happening for me. Yes. Awesome. Thank you for explaining that. Cause I think it, it often, like it often gets said, but not often gets explained and understood what, what it means to have a relationship with yourself, right. To fill that, that emptiness there. So, okay. Back to your story. You were, you left your rather you and your husband divorced. Your life was gray. You were looking to fix more people, more people, more people, look for more people, fix more people. So, um, I changed bars. I, I went to a closer bar. I moved to it. I got it. I moved into an apartment and there was a bar within walking distance, which made it safer. I didn't have to drive home. I could stagger home. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and my life became even crazier. And I, I started doing even crazier things. Like I wasn't married anymore. So that meant that part of fixing could be like dating. And I thought dating meant casual sex. And so I went through a whole series of pick you up at the bar, take you, we both stagger home to the apartment. We'll sleep together. We wake up in the morning. He says, I'll call you. I say, yeah, let's get, I'll see you tonight. And then I never see them again. Right. Um, that got to the point where I remember one time I picked up a guy at the bar. I tossed him. I wasn't finished drinking yet. So I tossed him the keys to my apartment, told him I'd meet him there. This is somebody I'd just met that day. So I'd meet him there. I got there. He was still there. We did spend the night together. I did never see him again. And when I looked around the apartment, when I sobered up, I realized that my half my jewelry was gone with him. I, I never, ever saw him again. Yeah. Um, but he got the jewelry. And I still didn't realize that what I was doing wasn't working. So in your mind, what was going on? Because from the outside, we can look at that now and be like, okay, clearly... Clearly, this isn't go this isn't flying. <laughs> yeah. But it at the time, what was like? What was going through your mind? What were you thinking and and believing about the circumstances? The make wrong was about me. It was that I hadn't found the right person to fix. Uh, 
if I could just find the right person to fix, then this was all going to be fixed. Gotcha. Because once I found the right person to fix, they were going to fill up the hole in me. I was going to fill up the hole with fixing them Mm -hmm. with no thought of what would happen once they were fixed. Other than that, we would both be fixed together and we would live happily ever after. Not so much. Mm -hmm. The next person I met was a cocaine dealer. And he moved into my apartment. So I thought I solved the first problem. I had somebody great to take care of because he was there all the time. Most of the time sleeping. And the rest of the time we would go to the bar. And at first we just drank together, but the alcohol was make the alcohol was not solving the problem. And I was starting to recognize that throwing up all the time was not so pleasant. If I didn't want to throw up, I couldn't drink because when I drank, I only drank to the point of that falling down blackout drunk. Mm -hmm. And he said to me one night, I can help you feel better. And as long as we're together, it will always be free. Now, I was a person who had never even taken, like, I didn't even abuse prescription drugs. You know, if you gave me a painkiller for a toothache, I would take it when I had the toothache. If you gave me an aspirin for a headache, I would take it if the headache got terrible. And that was the way I used medication. So I was, I was dead against, this is going to sound crazy. I was dead against marijuana. You don't smoke marijuana. You don't use marijuana. That's crazy stuff. And he sprinkled a line of cocaine, this little white powder, and I knew what it was. I'm not going to tell you that I didn't know what it was. He sprinkled this line out on my kitchen counter, and he said the magic words. He said, that will take all your problems away. What a sales pitch, eh? And by that point, that was all that I wanted. All that I wanted was for this horrible problem, this horrible, empty darkness to go away. Mm-hmm. and so i tried it so how do you how did you go from no drugs to there's a line of coke here and i i know that you just said well i really want my problems to go away but were there any other thoughts or like things getting in your way like holy shit what am i about to do here or beliefs that you know started to show up in you like an identity thing or or anything like that 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 appeared at that time because that's a pretty critical moment there there was probably about a minute or two of this is illegal i'm gonna go to jail and that was more the thought pattern it wasn't i couldn't connect it with the consequences for my body right mm. probably if i could have connected it with the consequences for my body I probably wouldn't have touched it. Right. But so there were two things there was. So, so the angel was saying, you're going to, the angel was saying the only thing that the angel could think of to say, the angel was saying, you're going to go to jail. Right. That will get you sent to jail. And the devil was saying, he lives in your apartment, (laughs) packs the stuff at your kitchen table. You're no more likely to go to jail from doing that little line of stuff on your counter. And it's not going to hurt you. You're only going to do it once. It's going to take the problem away. Mm. And at that, in that instant, I chose to believe the devil. Mm -hmm. I snorted that line and the problems felt like they went away. There was a, like this, this instant euphoria that I cannot describe anymore, but there was this certainty that I had never felt in my life that I was totally in control, that I was Mm. totally okay, that everything was going to be fine. And I was like, Oh my God, this is what it feels like to be okay. This is what okay is. Right. Then my heart started to race. Then my thoughts started to race because this is a progression of this drug as it hits your body, as it starts to affect all your centers and everything. And um, then fairly quickly, I wasn't high anymore. And the dark was back and the empty was back. 
And the thing about using a drug like cocaine is that because that euphoria, that high is so high, when the high is gone, the low seems even lower. So I fought it for a little while. And by a little while, I mean, yeah, maybe like eight hours. And after eight hours, I, I couldn't, I didn't identify that I was craving the drug. What I identified was that I was craving that feeling of being in control, that everything is okay. Right. That was all that I wanted again. I wanted to know everything was going to be okay. And so I did more and I did more and I did more and I spent two years doing more and more and I lost everything. I lost my job. I lost all my money. I was almost arrested. Fortunately, I didn't get arrested. Um, I lost my connections with my family because I didn't want them to know. I didn't want them to see. I didn't want anybody because I knew that it wasn't working. But by the time I knew that, again, just like with the alcohol, by the time that I knew it wasn't working, I also didn't know any other way out. It's like, how do you get out? Mm -hmm. Anytime I stop, the dark gray goes back and it's worse than it was before. And it got so bad that I would sit on the floor and I would cry. And I would sit on the floor and I would be crying and I would be going, I don't wanna do any more. And I can't afford to do any more. And I've, I've mortgaged everything I've got to do more. But I can't stop even crying now. Now I can't stop crying even. Mm -hmm. Now I can't even fix people because all I can do is cry. So even broken people see me as more broken than they are. Yeah. And anybody who was even remotely healthy, who had been in my life, who had reached out to me, who had tried, by then they just gave up. They just went... We're done. So in a pursuit for fulfillment and control of your life, what you got was more emptiness and less control. Bigger hole, more out of control, more sadness, more everything bad. Mm. So shortly after I almost got arrested, I decided that the solution was to leave town. It was a geographic cure. I would, I would leave town and I would leave my problems behind. Now, from the time I was a little girl, I loved carnivals. And I was living in Ottawa at this time and the Ottawa exhibition was on and I went to the exhibition and I met a guy who worked at the exhibition and he said, you wanna come to a party tonight? And well, I was, yeah, I was the party girl at that time. So I was like, sure, let's go to the party tonight. So I went to the party that night and he was running an illegal operation out of a hotel room and that didn't matter because pretty much everything in my life that I was doing was illegal so and I got some free drugs at the party and forgot about the other guy I didn't want him anymore because I wanted him out of my life anyway okay and dealer? this guy this, this is the cocaine dealer that you're saying you wanted out okay yeah, I, I wanted the cocaine dealer gone because, because I blamed him for almost getting arrested, right? I, th this is denial at its maximum, but almost getting arrested had nothing to do with the fact that I was, by this point, at this point, daily using cocaine. Didn't even see that. It was all his fault because he was dealing out of my apartment. Right. That's what caused me to almost get arrested. Yeah, no, it's not because it was it didn't even happen at my apartment. It happened at a friend's apartment. Gotcha. But that's what I blamed. I threw him out of the apartment. Mm -hmm. So I hooked up with the carnival guy. He told me he was going to show me the world. And I went off on an adventure and thought I was going to be fine. And we did the carnival thing and had the adventure. And every night was a party. And again, I'm going to show my age at seven o'clock every morning the Jetsons would come on TV. The cartoon, the Jetsons would come on TV. And that meant it was time to go to bed. The Jetsons came on TV at seven o'clock in the morning. I would go to bed. Now, if you have never used cocaine, it is not very helpful to go to bed when you're very, very wired because your brain just keeps racing until you come down. Right. And once you come down, then all you're thinking about is more drugs. So at seven o'clock in the morning, we would end the party. I would lay down in bed. My brain would race. I would try and sleep. And so I wouldn't sleep. 
I would be thinking I would be like just zooming like like your brain is running like lightning it's running everywhere and then um and eventually you come down and then you fall asleep because you feel so horrible wake up and do it all over again Mm -hmm. i did that he did take me to see the world large chunks of the world only small pieces of it i remember but we saw large chunks of the world i had a bunch of adventures um my cocaine use escalated i went from using powder cocaine to crack cocaine. Um, anybody? For, for anyone who doesn't know, like, drugs, can you explain what crack is? You take you take cocaine and you, you take the powdered cocaine and you mix it with other chemicals, heat it up, and then let it cool, and it turns into, like, a little rock-type substance. Um, you break those rocks up and you smoke them. Mm-hmm. This is the equivalent of in sticking your head, if spraying your oven with oven cleaner, sticking your head in your oven and breathing very deeply. So any housewives who are out there who have ever cleaned their oven and accidentally had a breath of that stuff and you cough and you choke and you feel horrible. That really is what it's like. And it does horrible things. If there's anybody out here right now who is doing cocaine and has not done crack, don't do it. Get help first. I did permanent, irreparable damage to my body. My lungs will never work the way they worked before. I don't want that for anybody. So if, if, if you're thinking about it, reach out to somebody, reach out to me, reach out to Jordan. Jordan will connect you with me. If you're thinking about it, find some place to get help. Don't do it. It won't solve your problem. It won't fix anything. Yeah. And it didn't fix anything for me. As I said, I did permanent irreparable damage to my body. Um, eventually the adventure ended we came home. I ended up in Toronto. Um, I was living in an apartment with six other people. And how old were you at this point? I was 20... 28. Yeah, it so, took three years for this whole downhill slide. Yeah. So three years to go from you know, getting into like non-functioning alcoholism to crack. Yep. Yep. Um, the slope is not necessarily that fast for everybody, but that was my slope and it was that fast. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's this one comment that I just want to share with you here. Um, this was from a few minutes ago. I'm not sure exactly what we were talking about at the time, but Erica wanted to say thanks for sharing such a vulnerable moment. Uh, with everything that was going on for you. So, so sorry, continue. Um, Just in terms of that, I believe that if there's no point in doing something like this, if I'm not going to be honest about it, Um, we talked about it for a long time before I did this. And, and um, there were a lot of things that I had to consider as far as consequences for it. But I believe that the good I can do outweighs anything, any negative that it might have. And I believe that anybody who sees me in a negative light as a result of hearing this story is not somebody who needs to be in my life anyway. Nice. That's the decision I eventually made. Now, if you would ask the broken Brenda that, um, so that's just, the, that's the difference. And when I get to the end of the story, but, but that's the difference between where I am today and where I was then. Where I was then was desperately, terribly afraid that anybody who was functioning, because when you're doing all those drugs, I could fit, I knew the difference between functioning and non-functioning, and I knew I wasn't functioning anymore. I just didn't know a solution. Right. So the terror is that anybody who is functioning is going to realize that you're not functioning and they're all going to go away. And they're the, they're the ones that by then I wanted around. I knew I wanted functioning people. I still thought I needed people to fix, but I was so non-functional that functioning people would go, Oh no, 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 no. (laughs) 
mm-hmm. you get like five minutes of their time and then they can see that brokenness. Right. Cause it was so broken. Um, when we moved to Toronto, I got a job again though, because you got to support the Hobbit, right? You got to work. You got to have money coming in. I was, I was not a thief. I could not rob people. So I got a real job. I went to work in a taxi company. And I worked my way up through that taxi company. I hid my addiction. I used all night. I would, or I would use all day if I was working night shift. I would use all day if I was working night shift. I slept very little. I depended on cocaine to keep me going. And um, I hid from the people that I was working with that I was using. They knew my boyfriend did, but they did not know that I did. And they all felt sorry for me. Poor Brenda with the boyfriend who's messing up her life. Right. And at one point I was booked for a shift and I was supposed to be at work at 11 o'clock. This was pretty much, this was almost the bottom. I was booked for an 11 o'clock shift and we were at home and we were using, and I was getting ready to go to work and I did some crack and I had a seizure and I passed out. And I came to, and the first thought was give me more because I missed the high. So he gave me more. And then I called the office and I said, I'm not, I, I, I'm sick. I can't come in. This was like 10 minutes before I was supposed to be at work. I'm sick. I can't come in. I, we kept going. Um, we did one, there was one other incident that happened that I'm just, I'm going to leave out just, I sure. prefer to, but um, the next morning or the next day I showed up at the office, like nothing had happened, right? Got it all under control again. My boss called me into the office and my boss said, you have a choice, get rid of the boyfriend or I can't keep you. I need to depend on you. And I sat there and I listened to his lecture and I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. I got it under control. Everything's good. Got it, got it, got it. And then in my head, I was saying to myself, I'm okay. They don't know it's me. He's blaming him. I'm all right. And he's like, okay, so we're clear. I'm like, yep, we're clear. He's like, okay, go back to work. I stood up. I reached for the doorknob. And when I reached for the doorknob, There were two people in the room. My boss, if he ever sees this, I am eternally grateful to him. And myself, when I reached for the doorknob, I heard a voice like there was someone else in the room. And the voice said, if you walk out that door, you're going to die. And I turned around and I looked at him and I said, while I'm getting him some help, I think I better get me some too. And my boss looked at me with total shock. And then he went, I think you better sit down. And I sat down and we talked about what was happening. Anybody who is employed, when you disclose to your employer, they're obligated to help you. They are obligated to offer you assistance. So he called the HR manager in and the HR manager I held in such high esteem. And I was so mortified that she was going to be part of this conversation. And the three of us had a conversation and he said, okay, I'm going to find the resources. We're going to get you help. Um, But you have to meet us halfway. You can't do any drugs for 24 hours. You have to wait 24 hours while we source out while we're going to help you. That was the longest 24 hours of my life. I said, okay, all right, I'll do that. Now, when I said, okay, I had no idea how I was going to do it. Right. I had no idea how I would do that. It seemed like Mount Rushmore. Jordan, you run. If -hmm. you said to me, you're going to, that I was going to come with you on your next run that would be about as likely as it seemed as the possibility to me of being able to stay clean for 24 hours. Right. 
anybody who's listening, picture like your hardest, your, your biggest challenge that you've ever imagined. And that's how I felt about this. That's how big it seemed. Um, but I went home and I crawled into bed and I pulled the covers over my head and I stayed away from everybody until it was time to go into work the next day. And that's how I didn't do how I didn't use drugs that day. I'd, and I felt horrible. I felt sick. I felt my brain was crazy. I felt like I felt like I was going to die. I kind of wished I could not to a suicidal type way, but just to like end this sick horribleness. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, just, yeah. I went into work the next day and my boss said to me, okay, we've booked an appointment. The three of us are going, I'm, I went to the Donwoods Institute, which doesn't exist anymore. Um, it's all changed now, but I went, he said, we, we've booked an appointment. I'm taking you. You're, we're going to the Donwoods Institute. Three of us are going together. We're going to get you help. I was like, okay, all right, I'm in. And we went to the Donwoods Institute. And when we got there, it was, it's this beautiful place and like this parkland and everything was beautiful. And we walked inside and we had to go into this auditorium and we had to watch a presentation. And we went in and we watched the presentation and we came out of the presentation and my addict mind kicked in. And I said, you know, that was really good. But, but now I've done 72 hours. I've done 72 hours without using, I can just do this. I, I got this all. Thanks. Thanks for taking me. Thanks. But you know, I don't need this because the presentation told me that I was going to go and I was going to stay there for 30 days I was not going to leave that facility for 30 days and I was going to eat what they told me to eat and I was going to do what they told me to do and they were going to get me clean of drugs. And I was like, yeah, no, I'm not locking myself up with a whole bunch of strangers. Plus they told me I was going to have a roommate. Hmm. I'm not locking myself up with a bunch of strangers. So I told the boss, I said, no, don't need the help. She so said, okay, well, so this is where the hardball comes in. The boss said, okay, well, that's fine. But now we've, and then the HR manager looked at me and she said, we've met our employer obligation. If you screw up again in any way, you're gone. Now, if I lose my job, I can't do drugs because I can't pay for them. And I kind of wanted to live. So I said, let me think about it. This made me familiar to you, Jordan, from another conversation we had recently. Yep. <laughs> I said, let me think about it. And they did not say what you said to me. What Jordan said to me when we had the conversation was, okay, but make a decision. They didn't say that to me. They just said, okay, you know the consequences. Um, I went home and that night I couldn't, I couldn't not use. And I used again and I went into work the next day and I went, okay, I'll check in. I'll do the program. I'm going to, I'll do the program. I'm in. All right. And my, uh, my head was telling me there was no way this could work. My head was telling me that, that, yeah, like, what's this going to do? What's, what's 30 days going to do? So the, but there's a wait list. What I didn't count on is there's a wait list. Mm -hmm. You don't go straight into 30 days that day. So I had once a week, I had to go to Donwoods for a meeting and sit with a group of other people who were all addicts and talk about crazy things like feelings and, mm. and all of that stuff. And okay, for a person who wants to fix people, it was a dream come true because I could kind <laughs> of like go around the room and go, okay, I can fix, I know how to fix you. I know how to fix that. I know how to fix this. Um, I fell in love. Yeah, I didn't act on it. We did not act on it, but I fell in love because they tell you don't have any relationships. Mm -hmm. um, but the other thing that they told me was to go to a 12-step program. And I was like, what's this now? Now what are you telling me to do? Um, but I had made the commitment. And because I had made the commitment, I decided that I would do whatever they told me to do because I thought, well, at least it'll make this time go quicker until I go do this 30 days and get it all over with and it's done mm -hmm. and I can get on with my life. 
So I started going to 12 step meetings. Um, the person I fell in love with from that group took me to 12 step meetings every day. He picked me up every day and we would drive to a 12 step meeting and we would go to the meeting together and then he would drive me home. And it was keeping me away from people who were using. And there's a magic, there is a magic in support groups of any kind. When you get around a group of people who are all working on the same thing, even if you don't have exactly the same problem, there's a magic that happens. Mm -hmm. And the magic happened. And I got more addicted to going to a meeting every day than I was to getting high. And so what was it that the meeting was giving you that was making it so enticing? I, I felt better. I felt a sense of belonging mm -hmm. that I recognized that the drugs never gave me. The drugs, the drugs numbed the problem. Drugs of any kind, whether you take prescription drugs, use alcohol, use food, whatever you use, it numbs the problem. It covers the problem up, it masks it, but the problem always comes back. Right. Because you always, whatever you're doing, whatever you're doing that's bad for you, you always have to take a break at some point. Yeah. Right. You cannot do it 24 hours a day. So what, it, what was happening with the meetings, I started to connect now there was something that I realized about the meetings that was, there was kind of a change that started happening when I was going to those meetings because I stopped looking for people to fix. And I started looking for people who had been there for at least a year or more because I could see something in those people. That was what I had known that I wanted all along. It was that I'm okay. Right. And I could see that they had it. So after the meeting, I would go to lunch with a group of people who had a year or more, because if you ever, if you have a problem that, ha that offers a 12 step program, if you get around the people who have a year or more, they love on newcomers, right? They're the first healthy people who actually say, I, I, I want to help you. I right. want to be there for you. And that's, and, and that's what they were doing. They were just giving me this love and this support and this, they were the affirmation that my head, my head couldn't tell me that I could do it. My head, I didn't know if I could do it, but they were telling me I could do it. And I just got more and more active in that group. It came time to go to the 30 days. I went and I did my 30 days. And the hardest part of those 30 days was that I was arguing with them because every day I was arguing with them saying, let me go to a 12 step meeting. Let me go to my 12 step meeting. And they were saying, you can't leave the facility yet. You can't leave the facility yet. Well, if you're on good behavior, there's one meeting that happens in the facility. You get to go to that one every week. Right. So I'll go to that one every week. But the, after three weeks, you're allowed out of the facility. And I went to my 12-step meetings again, went mm -hmm. back to doing my 12-step meetings and doing their program. And they taught me all kinds of things that 12-step didn't teach me. So they taught me stuff about codependency. They taught me stuff about my role in my family. They taught me all of those kind of things. I st have stayed connected with 12 step programs with my, I'm in Narcotics Anonymous. I'm a member of Narcotics Anonymous. I have a sponsor. I have stayed permanently connected to my 12 step meetings. I never used cocaine again after that day. Now, I'm not bragging when I say this, but I am a miracle because I never relapsed. Yeah. That is a miracle. Most people, so for anybody out there who is trying and hasn't had that miracle happen yet, we say something in 12 step, we say don't quit before the miracle happens. So keep coming back, keep trying, keep reaching out, keep reconnecting and the miracle will happen. Just don't die before it does. That's, yeah. that's, that's my strongest message to you. Don't die before it does. Um, I've had, I'm not going to say that my addictive personality went away. I continue to have an addictive personality. I continue to do things to the 
for this degree, I sometimes still slip and try and find people to fix. But uh, here's the difference. Now I'm aware of what I'm doing and I make a choice. And I have some kind of a boundary that I set for myself that says, okay, at this point it's done. Um, my, my most recent, the emptiness is not completely gone, but the emptiness, I would say I am three quarters full at least. The empty place is at least three quarters full. And I have the ability now, I was talking to somebody the other day and what I was saying to them, and, and I realized it when I was saying it, what I was saying to them was you got to listen to yourself and you got to trust yourself. Mm. So I now have the ability to listen to myself and trust myself. The thing, to, and a caution for anybody out there who is listening to this, when you are listening to yourself, listen to your heart, question your head. If I'm getting a message from my head, I ask myself whether it's best for me. Mm -hmm. But if it's coming from my heart, then I know to follow it. I don't know how to describe to you how to know which one is which. Um, my best suggestion, if you want to start figuring out which one is which, work with Jordan. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the plug. That, that is a shameless plug for Jordan, but, but Jordan, my, Jordan has helped me with my most recent challenge. Um, because food is my challenge. Anybody who can see me sees my lovely round face, but Jordan's going to post some pictures of me from before. Um, I'm going to send them to him and he's going to post some pictures of me from before. I have released 38 pounds now. Congratulations. That story is for another day. The only thing I'm going to tell you about it is that this is the first time in my life that I have released weight and not brought any of it back on. My closing thought for you, I think I'm almost out of time, right, Jordan? Yeah, we're, we're, we got to be wrapping up here soon. So my closing thought for you is if you are struggling with any kind of an addiction, an obsession, connect with somebody who you trust and talk to them about it. It's not just a shameless plug for Jordan. He really has helped me unbelievably. The way he does his program is totally different. You want to change your lifestyle. You need to make a lifestyle change. To change these things, to break these patterns, you have to make a lifestyle change. It's not a diet. It's not an abstinence. Because that alone isn't going to fix it. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, that. That just so everyone knows that <laughs> that was not the intention here. <laughs> not trying to trying to sell myself. Um, but Brenda, you have had an incredible story, incredible progress, um, and it's really inspiring for for me and everyone around you to see you make such big strides and to make such big progress because that mountain that you are climbing is huge. And there's one question I want to ask you before we wrap up here. And you were talking about constantly giving attention to other people, constantly trying to fix other people, right? But who was the one person who actually needed that attention? Me. Absolutely. Right. I couldn't see that because every time before I figured it out, every time I looked at myself, all that I saw, I just saw broke. I just saw yuck. And now, now I see, now I see progress. Now I see goodness. Now I see, I see health and I see, I see so much possibility. The sky is the limit. If you use drugs to get high, let me tell you, that the high of healthy is way better, way better. I don't think I've ever heard someone say that, but I love that saying. It Absolutely. Is. Absolutely. Because I can get the rushes from, now I get the rushes from facing my next challenge, seeing it as an opportunity, not an obstacle, but then figuring out how I'm going to get over it, beating it. That's where the rush comes from. Yeah, there's nothing quite like that, right? Totally. Awesome. Brenda, thank you so much for being here, sharing your story. Is there any last things that you want to say 
before we wrap up? All of you can do it. Every single one of you can do it. Every single one of you has it in you to do it. Don't quit. Don't, as I said earlier, don't give up before the miracle happens. Nice. Thank you. You as the listener now talking to you, what are you going to do with all of this information? How are you going to bring this into your lives or the lives of the people that you care about, the people that are around you? Because we all have people that are struggling. If, if let's say that we are somehow a miracle person and, and are perfect and don't have any struggles, which would suck, but <laughs> we are all struggling in some way and the people around us are struggling in some way. So how are you going to now implement this into your life and in the lives of the people around you? Who do you know that could benefit from hearing Brenda's story? Share this message with them because this might be the one thing that they need to hear to change their life. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Brenda, for being here. We will be back next week with another story. Of course, Saturday, 10 a.m. Come join us live. Join into the discussion. Post your questions and comments. Love having you here. Thank you so much and see you next week.